Revive us has been the cry of my heart as pastor, the cry of my heart as a born-again child of God personally. I've had a growing desire in my spirit for more of God. I've been saved since I was 17. That was quite a long time ago. And I've experienced the Lord in many wonderful ways over the course of my relationship with Him. The presence of the Lord is almost always sweet in the atmosphere here. And we don't, we don't pat ourselves on the back for that because you don't coerce the Lord into anything. The Lord has just chosen to be here at Overflow Church. But I have a hunger. I have a hunger on the inside of me for more presence, more power, more glory, more of the weight of his presence in my life. And on Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you see it, because you've chosen to allow me to be your pastor, you got to come along for the ride God's got me on. And the ride is heading toward revival, heading toward more of his glory, and that's what we've been talking about. And last week we came around to talking about the house cleaning and readying ourselves for revival, and we talked about realizing the value of revival. Now, I'm not going to preach that message again, but I'm going to build upon it. But I want to ask you some questions. Now, I like your amens, and I like your affirmative answers, and I like you responding to my preaching. I want you to do that, except these next, I've got four questions to ask you, and I just really want you to reflect on them, and then you can start amening again, okay? Do you believe there is more of God to experience in this life? Are you interested in experiencing more of God in this life? Here's the big question. Are you willing to do what it takes to experience more of God in this life? Because while grace is free, glory is not. Do you value revival and long for more of God's power and presence in your life? No matter how you answer those questions for yourself, no matter what answer you give, I've got a question to ask that's going to be the topic of my thoughts this morning. How's your foundation? In other words, what is your life built on? The answer to that question determines your level of stability under pressure. The answer to that question determines your level of ability to bear up under the pressure of God's weighty glory. A foundation, if we were to define it, is the lowest load-bearing part of a building, or could I even say of a person. It's that foundation, that place that everything else rests upon, that everything else is built upon, typically below ground level, or a foundation is an underlying basis or principle. What is it that you build your life upon? Let's listen to what Jesus says about that very thing in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6. I'm reading the New Living Translation right here. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. This is Jesus speaking. And Jesus isn't speaking to the difference between believers and unbelievers here. Jesus is speaking to believers who obey him and believers who do not. 
Now, I know that maybe some righteous indignation could rise up in you at this point. And you might say something like, how can a person call themselves a believer and not obey Jesus? And I would respond to you by saying, that's a valid question. But it seems to be something believers do all the time. Aren't you glad you came to church? It is absolutely possible to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and not obey him. The book of James says that even the demons believe and tremble. The sworn spiritual enemies of God who have no hope of redemption believe that Jesus is the Son of God and they are terrified about it. Even the enemies of God The spiritual enemies, those spiritual principalities know who Jesus is and James declares they believe and they are terrified. To have a strong spiritual foundation, we must believe and obey Jesus. To have the ability to bear up under the pressures of this life, we must believe and obey Jesus. To become capable of hosting the presence of God, we must believe and obey Jesus. I'm a grace preacher, I'm a grace believer, and I always will be as long as the Lord allows me to stand behind a pulpit. But grace without obedience is cheapening the work of God. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter 14 and verse 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, say those three words with me, and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest or reveal myself to him. Do you want more of God in your life? Do you want a greater revelation of Jesus in your life? Do you want more of his glorious power and presence in your life? Do you want to walk with more of the favor of God on your life? Know his commandments and keep his commandments. He says, If we do these things, we are the ones that love him. Can we honestly say, I love you, Lord, while we willingly ignore, neglect, or disobey any of his commandments? Oh, Pastor Jeff, that's hard. It's Christmas, man. Lay off. Well, Jesus asked the same question in Luke 6 and 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? (laughs) That's a nice kick in the gut, isn't it? But listen, if we're really hungry for more of God, that means we're going to be willing to do whatever it takes to get to more of God. And that means we're going to have to make sure our foundation is laid correctly. We're going to have to make sure it's built in the right place. We're going to have to make sure that we hold to what Jesus said. Now, clearly, God is patient with us. Amen to that. That he is incredibly merciful, and he works with us as we work out our salvation. All of us are on, we're, we're heading toward the same place if we're following Jesus. We just don't all arrive at the same time. We're all working out our own salvation. But if we are going to be strong in the Lord when the storms of life, and 2020 has been a pretty good storm. If we're going to be strong in the face of those storms, and if we are going to become the containers for the glory of God, we are going to have to build upon the bedrock of faith and obedience to Jesus. In fact, We're kind of like Saul was, King Saul, back in the day. He was hoping that his outward show of praises would be enough. But when Samuel got there, he said, Obedience is better than all of your sacrifices. You can make all the noise you want worshiping me. You can make all the noise you want about giving sacrifice unto me. But obedience is better than sacrifice. Can I tell you this morning that grace always leads us to obedience to Christ. 
The church in America in 2020 needs to grab a hold of that fact because there have been too many preachers that have cheapened the gospel by saying that grace covers every action, every thought, every deed, every word. It sure does if you're following him with all your heart. But if you're playing with the world, you're not keeping his commandments and doing the things which he says. Therefore, you cannot honestly call him Lord. Oh, by the way, you all got to love me to get to heaven. 1 John 5 and 3, the beloved apostle wrote, Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. The only part of us that hates the sound of this is our flesh, which was supposed to be crucified at the cross. If you're offended by the message that you've got to keep his commandments, it's not your spirit and your soul, it's your flesh, which is supposed to be dead when you came to Christ. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, yet I live. And the life that I live in the flesh, I now live in him. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the message. So if you're offended by this word, it's your flesh, and you need to tell your flesh to die. (laughs) Merry Christmas. As long as we are talking about our foundation this morning, let's talk about fixing the cracks. Allow me to put this another way that might help us understand this, because I believe that most of you, if not all of you this morning, believe that you have a strong foundation and you do your best to do the things that please the Lord. I believe that I am in the company of fellow believers. I believe that you're the people of God. Now, I don't know all of you personally, and we don't spend a lot of time in social settings outside of this one, so I'm not following you around in life. Yes, if you think someone's following you, it's not me. I'll never do it. I have no interest in doing it. You better ask God about it. Hopefully you don't have any ties to the mob. I believe that you love the Lord, and I believe that you are the people of God. If you didn't have something in you that loved God, you wouldn't even be here today. You'd be doing something else with your time. I believe this is true of you. I like to think the same of myself. My foundation is upon Jesus. But sometimes even the most well-built foundations get cracks in them. Ever had anyone lay cement in your driveway? It doesn't mean the foundation isn't still strong for the most part, but it has some smaller areas, the cracks, that are susceptible to crumbling under pressure. You know those places in your driveway you try to miss when you're pulling into your garage because you know if you drive over it with your car, it's going to crumble even more. Cracks in the foundation. I want to read from the book of Ezra, one verse, and then I'm going to give you a little history behind it. It's, it reads this way, Ezra 4 and 12, Let it be known to the king that the Jews, the people of God, who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. Someone say those words with me, repairing the foundations. In the Old Testament, in the days of Ezra and the Nehemiah who followed him, Israel had been in exile for their sin. But there came a time when Israel found favor in the eyes of the foreign kings that had captured them, and he allowed them to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple and then the city walls and the gates. The enemies of the people of God, the enemies of Israel, didn't like this one bit. And this was actually part of the letter they had sent back to the king to give them him a report on what they, these upstart Israelites are doing back in Jerusalem. They are repairing the foundations. You see, the enemies of the people of God needed the foundation to remain in ruin. Or at least they needed places of weakness they could exploit. Maybe you're starting to see where this is going. 
they needed places of weakness to remain that they could exploit in order to keep the people of God under their influence. They knew in their hearts that if they rebuilt the temple and temple worship was restored and if they built the city walls and gates, they would come back and they would be a people again and they would be well fortified again and they would stand up in resistance against their oppression and they didn't want that for any reason. Can I tell you this morning, the devil doesn't want you to have a strong foundation. The devil wants access points into your life. It's exactly what the devil wants to do in every believer's life. If he cannot get you to renounce your faith in Jesus, he wants to convince you that small cracks in your foundation really aren't a problem. I know you're loving this one. When in fact they are the potential areas he can exploit, and weaken your faith, destroy your testimony, and upset your relationship with Jesus Christ. He's looking for a crack that he can get in through so that he can exploit an area of weakness in your life. You may love Jesus with all your heart, but your unwillingness to forgive someone who hurt you is a crack in your foundation. You may have great faith in Jesus, but the little white lies you tell to protect your position is a crack in your foundation. You may engage frequently in leading others to faith in Christ Jesus, but your critical spirit is a crack in your foundation. You may worship Jesus openly in church services, but your bent toward gossip is a crack in your foundation. You may confess great faith in God, but your secret fears are a crack in your foundation. And I know that right now you're hoping that I would stop naming the cracks. Just in case I touched on the ones that could be named in your foundation. But church... Cracks are areas that make even the strongest foundations weak. I didn't write it into this message, but I'm going to share it with you. As David was coming into his authority as king over Israel, he had decided that Jerusalem was going to be the capital, that Jerusalem was going to be the seat of his authority and power. The thing is, is that Jerusalem wasn't in his authority at the time. And in fact, it was the most walled, fortified city of its day. And the enemies of Israel had Jerusalem at the time. And David came with all of his armies to take uh, uh, Jerusalem and lay siege against it. And the leaders of the city laughed at him and said, There's no way we are in penetrable that. You can't get in. In fact, he put the blind and the infirm and the deaf and those that had issues in their life, he put them on the wall said, you can't even get past them. We are so locked in here tight. But there was one crack that the leaders of Jerusalem didn't think about, and that was their water source. And David called for a person out of the armies of Israel to be willing to go in through the water source secretly. It would, prob- it would definitely be wet. It would probably be dirty. It would probably be tight squeezing. You're probably going to have to hold your breath and get underwater a little while. But the water, the water gets in there somehow. And a man named Joab stood up and said, I'll go. And he went in through the crack in the foundation, through the one secret passage that even the leaders of Jerusalem maybe had forgotten about. And he got in, snuck in, opened the gates, and David came into Jerusalem and left no one alive and took Jerusalem and sieged it and captured it, and it became the capital of Israel under his 40-year reign as king. At least most of the years of his 40-year reign. My point being, my point being, there was one crack 
in the foundation, one way in that they didn't realize about. I wonder what the enemy's way is into your life. I wonder what crack could be named in your life. I want to read from the Song of Solomon. I don't know that I have ever, ever, ever read from the Song of Solomon in a sermon all the 27 years of ministry. I don't know that I have ever preached a sermon included the song. So here it is. This is history for Overflow Church right here. It says, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. For the believer, it's not the big grievous sins that are the issue. Most Jesus followers agree that there are some big things we just don't engage in, right? But it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. The things that we think are insignificant, the things we believe grace gives us a pass on. The little struggles that are easy to ignore or not address are actually the very things the devil will exploit. The little areas that we reserve for ourselves, those little secret things we never tell about anybody, we never tell anybody about, those little areas of our life that we're too embarrassed to address or, 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 or even look at, things that we ignore, set aside, little activities that we may do that seem harmless in and of themselves, and I, I'm leaving that little area for my life. Now, I'm not suggesting that we become legalistic because I hate legalism. I believe in the power of God's grace, and I believe that that's the covenant that we are under. But I also believe that if we ignore the little areas of disobedience that we allow for ourselves, the very cracks in our foundation that the Holy Spirit has been convicting us about, if we allow it and let it continue, they will become the reason our house gets swept away by the storms. They will become the reason that we are unable to bear up underneath the weight of his glory as he rests upon us. Just because your culture or subculture embraces something doesn't mean that God is good with it if it's in opposition to his commandments. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's moral or acceptable to God. And just because we've gotten away with it for so long does not mean that God is ignoring it. <laughs> Psalm 89 and 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Understand something. The heart of God is not to publicly shame one of his sons or daughters over a crack in their foundation. The heart of God is to fix the crack. It's not my, if, it's, if it's not God's heart to shame you, it's not my heart to shame you. But it is my heart to say, if there's a crack, fix it. If there's a crack, let the Holy Spirit shine his light on it. And let his holy mortar, if you will, Fill that crack. Leave no weak areas in your life where the enemy can exploit you. Ruin your testimony. Steal your faith. It's the desire of God to make us strong in Him, to ready us for His glory so that we can be ready for revival, to seal up anything the enemy could use against us to render us useless for God's kingdom. Yes, we are under a covenant of grace, but grace teaches us to fix the cracks. God's word will speak to us if we are in it. The Holy Spirit will be able to convict and convince us about following and obeying Jesus right down to the smallest matter. So I agree with you, no, house cleaning is not very enjoyable. But the end result is, the end result is a house that is built upon the rock that no storm can sweep away. The end result is a container for the glory of God that he can rest upon. The end result is becoming a true follower of Jesus that shines brightly in any darkness. So, how's your foundation? Any cracks to fix? If you really want more of the presence and power of God in your life, you're going to have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit today and maybe address something you've left alone for years. 
or that you hoped would never come up. If you really want more of the presence and power of God in your life, if you really want the glory of God to rest upon your life, fix the cracks. If for no other reason, fix the cracks for your testimony's sake. Fix the cracks so nothing can be used against you. When you stand up for Jesus, somebody can't point their finger and accuse you. Fix the cracks. And your house will be strong. And revival can come to your life. How's your foundation? Stand with me this morning.